Hey guys and welcome to lesson 3 of the Game Gengu Genki series. In this video we're going to be looking at different types of verbs like Ichidan, Godan, Ru and U verbs. We'll be looking at present tense conjugation as well as kind of polite form. We'll be checking out a bunch of new particles, Masenka, frequency adverbs as well as having a look at Japanese word order. This video is brought to you by all of the wonderful supporters on the Game Gengu Discord community. If you want to support the channel then feel free to join us on Patreon and come say hi on the Game Gengu Discord. So without further ado let's get into some very important language here with lesson 3 of the Game Gengu Genki series. Okay, so starting off with a very important piece of language that unfortunately Genki doesn't do a very good job of teaching and actually most Japanese learning resources kind of do things in a strange way and that's teaching the different types of verbs. So all over the world, it's not just Genki, almost every single learning resource that teaches you Japanese around the world, not in Japan, but around the world, they teach this thing called Ru verbs and U verbs. And very, very simply, the rules for these verbs are all ru verbs end in eru or iru. These are verbs like taberu, Chotto taberu. neru, Atashi neru wa yo. okiru, ne. okiru no. miru. Ojijan terebi miru no suki? Mm, suki da yo. So as you can see, taberu, neru, okiru. Mi ru. So as you can see, it ends in an e or an e sound followed by ru. But not all verbs that end in eru or iru are ru verbs. Confusing, right? The other type of verb is known as an u verb. These are verbs that have a consonant followed by a u ending, as well as any verb that finishes in aru, oru, or uru. They're all also considered U verbs, even though they end in a ru. And there are even some of those exceptions that I mentioned previously, edu or iru verbs, some of those are actually also considered u verbs, which makes it incredibly confusing for a Japanese learner. Some common u verbs are nomu, <laughs> yomu, hanasu, Kiku and Iku. And then lastly we have irregular verbs. These are really simple, there's only two irregular verbs. Uh, here we have suru and kuru. And these don't follow any of the conjugation rules that the other verbs do. These are irregular, all you need to do is learn how to use suru and kuru, and then you don't have to worry about anything else. So the tricky thing here is the ru verbs and the u verbs. This is something that confuses a lot of learners, and honestly speaking, I've been learning Japanese for over 10 years, and even sometimes I'm like, which one's a ru, which one's u? I can get a little bit confused, because realistically, once you've learned Japanese, you do not ever think, wait a second, is this a ru verb or an u verb? Realistically, it doesn't matter, because you just learn how a verb is and how it's conjugated over time. However, because this is something that's covered in all Japanese classes as well as the Genki textbooks, we're going to go through it today in this video. However, if you're already confused at this stage, don't worry, I actually have one trick coming up that's going to make everything so ridiculously simple, you're going to think, why in the world aren't they doing it this way all across the world? So these types of verbs, ru verbs and u verbs, as well as the irregular two, sudo and kuru, they all have different conjugation rules when you conjugate something in different forms. Like for example, polite speech, past tense, potential, volitional, uh, lots of language that we're going to cover later on. And it's very important to know how a verb is conjugated, otherwise you can't use that verb freely. Now, Contrary to what Genki says, you don't actually have to memorize the whole list of every single verb and memorize which type this verb is, whether it's ru or u, and it can get very, very complicated, especially because there's a huge list of exceptions that you would think, according to the previous rules, make it a ru verb, but it's actually an u verb. Even just the name ru verb and u verb is incredibly complicated. Now, I would personally recommend to completely ignore the Genki explanations for these ru verb u verbs I wouldn't worry about that however just so you guys know and you can see how complicated these rules are 
With the ru and the u verbs, this is how the rules are explained to you in the textbook as well as anywhere else that you have a look. Verbs that end in an aru or oru sound is definitely an u verb. Verbs that end in an uru is either an irregular or an u verb. Verbs that end in an iru or eru are more likely to be a ru verb. However, they can also be an u verb. How needlessly complicated, right? Good news, I have a very simple solution for you all. So actually, this entire classification as ru and u verbs do not exist in Japanese. This is a completely made up concept for foreigners, learners of Japanese around the world to help them learn the rules. Which, in my opinion, actually makes things a whole lot more complicated. So for Japanese people, the way they learn the classifications of verbs, which group they belong to and learning how to conjugate them, in Japanese, it's actually classified as ichidan and godan verbs. Now I understand already, you know, that might sound very intimidating and scary, but it's actually very, very simple. And learning ichidan and godan instead of the ru and the u is gonna make your life so much easier. Very simply put, ichi means one and dan is like a grade or a rank. So ichidan is grade one. Godan here means five ranks, right? So godan verbs are rank five, ichidan are rank one. And the reason why they're called this is actually incredibly important and it's gonna make your life so much easier. Ichidan means kind of one grade or one stage. And very, very simply, all you need to do is simply drop the ru at the end of a verb and then just replace it with whatever conjugation that you need. That's it, you don't need to change anything about the word. Every conjugation is exactly the same. Just drop ru and add that conjugation. Whether nai for the negative, mus for the polite and so on. So these verbs known as ichidan verbs are actually the same as the ru verbs that we saw previously. They follow the exact same conjugation rules. However, you don't need to worry about all of the exceptions. So ichidan verbs are incredibly simple, just stage one verbs, right? So all you need to do is just have the stem, for example, taberu, get rid of the ru, and tabe is the stem. Then, taberu, tabenai, tabemas, tabereru, tabeyo. All you need to do is simply attach the conjugation to the end of the stem. That's the super simple verbs known as ichidan or also known as ru verbs. The other classification of verbs, godan, this means five stages. And this is very, very important. What this is referring to is the fact that when you conjugate the verb, it actually goes through the five sounds in Japanese, a, i, u, e, o, when you conjugate them. So you actually have to modify the verb itself and add the conjugation to the end. Let's take, for example, nomu, to drink. This is a godan verb, also known as u verbs. Nomu, for example, you wouldn't conjugate it in the same way as ichidan, right? Because there is no ru to drop. So let's say, for example, you drop mu, no, nai, doesn't make sense, it doesn't work. What you need to do instead is here, go with the five godan sounds. So a, for example, is the negative form. So all you need to do is just change the verb to a sound like one of these five. A, i, u, e, o. U is the dictionary form, nomu. So the nai form, the negative, would be no, ma. Nai, the a, no ma nai. For the mus form, for the polite verb, it's no mi mus. No ma nai, no mi mus, no mu. No ma nai, no mi mus, no mu, no meru, no mo. A i u e o. Once you wrap your head around this, it's actually much more simpler than the ru verbs and the u verbs because you don't have a list of exceptions that you need to worry about. This is how you deal with every ichidan verb, and this is how you deal with every godan verb. Now, you might be thinking, but how do you tell if a verb is an ichidan or a godan verb? Remember, with the ru and the u classification, you have a whole bunch of rules you need to remember, and you have a whole bunch of exceptions that are going to really confuse you. Well, with Godan and Ichidan, it is so, 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 so incredibly simple. This is it. Are you ready? All you need to do is have a look 
at the negative form of the verb, the nigh form. If the verb ends in an a, then it is a gordan. Simple as that, no exceptions always. For example, nomu, when you say nomu to drink, when you say this in the negative form, it's nomanai. So it's nomanai, right? It's the a sound. So it's a gordan verb. So if you simply remember that, then you'll be able to know how to conjugate all of these five conjugations just with this simple rule. Already, a, i, u, e, o. Nomanai, nomimas, nomu, nomeru, nomo. So that's for godan verbs. And for ichidan verbs, if a verb in the negative form, the nai form, has an i or an e sound to it, then it is an ichidan verb. Always. No exceptions, no rules you need to remember. When you look at a verb in the nai form, if it has a a sound, it's a godan. If it has an e or an e sound, it's an ichidan. For example, tabenai. It has an e sound, tabenai. So it's ichidan, also known as a ru verb. So this completely works as well if you want to think about it in the classifications of ru verbs and u verbs, that's fine. If the verb has an a sound in the negative form, then it's an u verb. For example, kiku, to hear. Kikanai, I don't hear. Yomu, to read. Yomanai, I don't read. So it has the a sound. So we know that it is a godan or an u verb. And if you want to know if something's a ru verb or an ichidan verb, then all you need to do is if it has an e or an s sounding in the nai form, then there you have it. Full proof way of figuring out whether something is a ru verb or an u verb or an ichidan or godan verb. It's incredibly simple. There's just one catch, and this is the reason why it's not taught like this around the world. You need to know the nigh form of a verb before you can know how to conjugate it. And the reason why this is how it's taught in Japan is because these rules are actually taught after people already know the nigh form of verbs. So it's very easy to just think, hmm, what's the nigh form? And then the rule applies. Whereas for foreign learners of Japanese, they don't know the nai form yet, and so the schools and the textbooks, they tried to come up with this way to help you figure out whether something is a certain type of verb classification without knowing any prior knowledge. And it gets really confusing, it gets really convoluted, and still to this day, I cannot use that ru u verb system to try and remember whether something is ru or u. If I've been learning for 10 years and I still can't rely on that system, it's not a good system. So what I recommend you guys do is instead of worrying about all of this ru and u complicated stuff, just when you learn a verb, learn the nigh form at the same time. If you do that, all of your problems, all of your worries are gone. You don't have to worry about all this tricky stuff with the ru and the u, you just need to remember the nigh form. And if it has an a uh sound, then it's a gordan or an u verb. And if it has an e or an e sound, then it's an ichidan or a ru verb. Not only will this make it much easier for you to remember the verb classification of verbs and how you conjugate them, but you're also going to know exactly how to conjugate them because just remember, a, i, u, e, o. Negative, polite, dictionary, potential, the volitional. This will also make your life a lot easier when you come across homophones, words that are written exactly the same but have a different meaning. Well, with the ru and the u verbs, how are you going to be able to tell them apart? They're written exactly the same, but sometimes they're the opposite type. Well, with the way that it's taught in the Genki textbook, you're not going to be able to figure this out, ever. You're just going to be stuck. You're going to have to remember a list of exceptions. But if you learn the nai form of a verb, when you learn the base form, then it's very, very easy. Let's take, for example, kiru. Now, kiru has two very common meanings. One of them, kiru, actually means to cut. And the other kiru actually means to wear something, like clothes. And one of them is an u verb or a godan verb. And the other one is a ru verb or an ichidan verb. How do you tell the difference? Well, how about this? I'm going to show you the nai form of both right now, and why don't you try yourself, figure out which one's which. Okay, so as we can see, to cut kiru in the nai form is kiranai, 
and Kiru to wear in the Nai form, the negative form, is just Kinai. So, which one do you think is Ichidan? One stage, also known as a Ru verb, the simplest type of verb. Well, we can see the one that simply drops the Ru and adds Nai is Kiru to wear. Kinai here is the negative form. So we can just tell instantly, right? We can see Kiru to wear, Kinai not to wear. Well, that's a Ru verb or an Ichidan. And the other one we see is Kiranai to not cut. Well, this is more complicated because you needed to add the a uh sound. Oh, so it has the five sounds. It's a godan or an u verb. Okay, great. So let's just try this one last time with the verb kaeru. This also has two commonly different meanings. One of them, kaeru, to return home. And the other one, kaeru, to change something. Okay, so kaeru, to return home's negative form, the nai form, is kaeranai. And kaeru, to change something's negative form, is just kaenai. Question, which one is an ichidan? Remember, e or i sounding. Kaeranai, kaenai. Kaeranai, kaenai. The answer is to change, kaeru. That is an ichidan. As we can see, it's an e sounding in the nai form. So if you remember those five rules, you'll be able to remember the entire conjugation rules for this verb. And likewise, with kaeru to return home, it's kaeranai, so we know it's the a uh sound, kaeranai, so we know that it's a godan, so we need to apply the same rules. So instantly, right now, if I wanted to say, let's go home, I know you haven't learnt that language yet, however, that's the volitional form. So we just add an o oh sound to it, kaero. Or let's try and be polite, kaerimas, kaerimas. The dictionary, kaeru. The knife form, kaeranai. It's so simple once you learn these rules. So hopefully this helps you. I know it's very complicated, seriously. Um, it took me a long time to wrap my head around verb conjugation and it really didn't help uh, being the very first thing that you're introduced was these complicated ru and u verbs. This is something that trips up every single learner. And so I highly recommend you guys, you can learn the ru and the u style if you want, but I highly recommend rather than learn all of these exceptions and all of these ridiculous rules that are just made up, just learn the knife form at the same time and all of your problems go away. Okay, so the next thing we're going to be learning in this lesson is the present tense conjugation. So we now know how to classify verbs. How do we make the present tense? So in this lesson in your textbook, you're going to be learning about a dozen different verbs that describe kind of these basic human actions. Things like watching, eating, drinking, going, returning. These are often referred to as action verbs. And when you use these verbs, these action verbs, it refers to either A, habitually doing something like as a habit, or B, showing that you will do this action in the future. And this is the present tense in Japanese, something that you either do regularly or something that you intend to do in the future. The present tense covers both of these. For example, gemu o suru. So gemu means game and suru means do. So this sentence right now, Game or suru. This could be either showing that you regularly play games or that you're going to play games sometime in the future. Which one that we're actually meaning you need to figure out based on the context of the sentence. So for example, if you wanted to say that I don't eat breakfast, whether regularly or for example sometime in the future, you simply just say asa gohan tabemasen or asa gohan tabenai. I don't eat breakfast. Now, often because the context is a little bit confusing, you don't know whether you're talking about a regular action or the future, often a little bit of extra language will be added to the sentence just to help make things clear. For example, game or suru, to play games, you might say, yoku game or suru. I often play games. Now we know automatically that it's talking about a habit. Or for example, kyoto ni iku, or kyoto ni ikimasu go to Kyoto. Well, if you wanted to make this a little bit more, you know, habitual that you're talking about, you could say, yoku Kyoto ni iku. I often go to Kyoto. Or maybe you want to say that you're going to go to Kyoto tomorrow. 
明日京都に行く。So adding this language can help make the context much clearer because you can use it in two different situations. So this is what's known as the present tense conjugation. And this is another thing that unfortunately Genki does a really bad job at actually teaching. Because it explains this in a really complicated way. So, if you have a look at your book right now, Genki teaches that the dictionary form of a verb is taberu, and the present form of a verb is tabemas. And then the present negative form of a verb is tabemasen. So, if you looked at this information, and this is what every single learner first sees, if you look at this information, You would assume that the dictionary form seems to be some sort of just classification form that you would use in dictionaries. It's called the dictionary form. And the present form is the one that you should use when you want to talk about the present. This is actually wrong. This is completely misleading. The dictionary form is also known as the casual form, and it holds the exact same meaning as this. Present form,、uh, tabe mas. This tabe mas is actually polite speech. And the reason why Genki doesn't tell you this right away is because it doesn't want to overcomplicate you with polite speech. But just so you know, in Japanese, there are different levels of politeness when you talk. Taberu is casual, tabe mas is polite. There is no different in meaning, just in the level of politeness. So just ignore this whole present form, dictionary form difference. They're all the present form. So you can see how Genki unfortunately made this a little bit more complicated by holding back this information from you. Okay, so with that out of the way, let's have a look at how we form this polite speech. It's super simple. We've already actually learnt the rules、um, just with looking at the conjugation previously. For ru verbs, or also known as ichidan, stage one verbs, all you need to do is just drop the ru and add mas. That's it. Remember, there's no tricky stuff you have to do. Just drop the ru and add mas. So, for example,、uh, the verb that we've seen a lot already today, taberu, to eat, what do you think the conjugation is? Well, drop the ru and add the mas. Taberu, tabe mas. Simple as that. Now you have polite speech. So, for example, I could say, Kyo wa pizza taberu. As for today, I'm gonna eat pizza. And if I wanted to be polite, so maybe I'm talking to someone with a different, maybe they're a little bit more distant from me, maybe they're higher up in kind of social status, maybe someone's parents or something, I wanna be polite, well then I would simply say, Kyo wa pizza tabemas. Exactly same meaning, just different level of politeness. Okay, but what about those tricky u verbs or godan verbs? Well, if you remember the previous rule, a, i, u, e, o. Negative was a, polite form was i. So, if you have a look at the ni form of a verb and it ends in an a, then all you need to do is turn it into an i sound and then add mas. Nomanai, nomimas. Kikanai, kikimas. Yomanai, yomimas. Ikanai, ikimas. It's as simple as that. Just remember the complicated verbs u or godan. You just follow i sound for a mas to make it polite, or an u sound, and that's the dictionary form or the casual form. Now there are also those two irregular verbs. If you remember, we have suru to do and kuru to come. So these irregular verbs are conjugated in the polite form as suru. Shimas, kuru kimas. Now, if you want to make it a negative, all you need to do is instead of mas, just add masen. So mas is the present polite, and masen is the negative polite. That's it. Whew, okay, so those two were very, very difficult, especially for beginners. So a huge otsukare sama. Very good job, everyone, for making it this far.、Um, those two things are stuff that really do overwhelm a lot of beginners. And this is where a lot of beginners start thinking, man, Japanese is hard. It doesn't have to be, it's just the way that it's taught. Unfortunately, the people who made Genki, the people who teach Japanese overseas, they decided on an order that they want to teach you. They decided to teach you the Mus form and conjugation before teaching you the ni form, and that made things just so much more complicated. So, I would highly recommend everyone just learn the ni form of a verb, and all of that that we just looked at is so much 
simpler. Okay, now we're onto something much, much, much easier, particles. So we've already learned some particles already. We learned about the Wa particle and the Nort particle in lesson one, and we also learned about the Mort particle in lesson two. Well, today in lesson three, we're going to learn about O, De, Ni, and E. And good news, most of these particles are pretty straightforward and not too complicated. So first we have this O particle. Now we can see that it's actually read as wo with a W, wo, but that's not how you say it. You just simply say O. That's it. It's always read as O. And this is what's called an object marker. This is because it marks the object of the sentence. Now, this classification could be confusing for some of you guys who don't know what an object is. Don't worry, it's actually really, really easy. All that means is the object of a sentence is what the verb is acting on, normally a noun. For example, kohi o nomu. Kohi is coffee, and then nomu is to drink. So, the action is drinking, and what do I drink? Kohi drinking coffee. The coffee is what gets drunk. That's the object in this sentence. The verb acting on the object, right? So for example, listen to music. Ongaku o kikimasu. I listen, kikimasu or kiku, to music. Ongaku. Or for example, watch TV. Terebi o mimas. Or terebi o miru. Soko no terebi o mite miru. So, what is it that you're watching? Miru? What's the object of the sentence? What are you watching? Terebi. TV. So in all of these sentences, the o particle marks something that has direct involvement with the verb. The coffee is what is being drunk. The music is what is being heard. The TV is what is being watched. The O particle simply follows a noun and this shows the direct involvement with the verb. That's it. So for example, let's say taberu to eat and let's have pizza for pizza. Pizza time. How would you say I eat pizza or I will eat pizza? So remember, the noun here is pizza, the verb is taberu, and to show this relationship that pizza is what I taberu, you put an o particle right in the middle. And that's it! Congratulations, you've made your first sentence using the o particle. The next particle is also super simple. This is the de particle. So this also follows nouns. And what this de particle does is it shows the place of action. So that's the focus in this lesson, showing the place that the action takes place. It's like pointing your finger. That's where the action takes place. So it's like place de verb. So for example, reading a book at the library. So at, right, at the library. Well, have a look at this sentence right here. So we have toshokan, that's library, hon, that's book, and then we have yomu, or yomimas, that means to read. So we have the de particle and the o particle. Where do you think the de particle goes in this sentence? Remember, the de particle marks the place of action. So should we put it after toshokan, library, or should we put it after hon, a book? So the action here is yomu, to read, and we read at the library. So the at, the de, is toshokan de hon o yomimasu. Okay, very, very nice. All right, what about this next sentence? To eat lunch at the park. So, koen is a park, lunch is hiru gohan, and to eat is taberu. So, where do you think you would put the de particle now? 
Remember, the dead particle marks the place of action. The action here is taberu, to eat. So, where do we eat? We eat at the park. So, koen de hiru gohan o taberu. So in these examples, the place that yomu happens, reading, is marked with the de. It's like pointing your finger at the library. Toshokan de. Or where the lunch is being eaten, it's at the park. Koen de. So really think of the de particle here as marking the spot that the action takes place. It's like pointing your finger and saying that's where it happens. Now, the de particle also has some more uses that you'll learn uh, over time in future lessons, but really simply, it marks the place of an action, the means of an action, or even the time of an action. But don't worry about that right now, we'll have a look in future lessons, but just so you know, this de particle is like marking where that action takes place. Okay, next we have the neat particle. Now, this is a little bit more tricky. Uh, this is definitely one of the most complicated particles that you're going to be learning in all of Japanese. So don't feel too bad about not understanding how it's always used. So today we're going to be looking at two of the easiest and most common uses of the knee particle. The first use is to express the goal of movement. That's how it's said in the book. And what this means is it's kind of like the destination of the action. So let's say, for example, iku to go. If you mark something with the ni particle, it shows that destination. For example, gakko ni iku, to go to school. That's our destination, to go to school. Or for example, Kyoto ni iku, to go to Kyoto. So it marks that place of destination. Another use of the ni particle is to mark the time an action takes place. For example, I go to bed at 10. Juji ni neru. Juji means 10 o'clock, neru means to sleep, and we mark when I go to sleep. Juji ni neru. So the time that the action happens is marked with this ni particle. And actually, this can be used more than once in a sentence. Maybe you want to mark the destination as well as the time. <gasps> right? For example, the sentence, I will go to Kyoto on Sunday. Well, that's fine. You can use the ni particle twice. So like here, nichiyobi ni, so on Sunday, kyoto ni, so to Kyoto, iku, I'll go. So firstly, the time the action takes place is expressed here with nichiyobi ni. The place that's the destination is kyoto ni, and then the action is iku, to go. So these are the two simplest uses of the ni particle, marking the goal of movement or the destination, as well as marking the time. There are many other uses of the ni particle that we will learn later, but just for now, I'll put them up here on the screen. Um, don't worry too much about them right now. Just know these two, just really focus on memorizing these two. Marking the destination of an action or marking the time of an action. Okay, finally we have e, the final particle that we're going to be looking at today. And as we can see, this e particle is actually written as he, but it's never, never said he, it's read as just simply e. So just like the o particle that we saw, just the same here. It's never read as he. Now, this e particle is very similar to the ni particle that we just learned. The e particle here marks the direction of action. So here it has more of an emphasis on the journey, the path to that destination. For example, Nihon e iku, go to Japan. You could also say Nihon ni iku, that's fine, but we're just talking about the destination with ni. But here, when we use e, it has this feeling of kind of emphasizing that journey, that path, the path to Japan, right? So, Nihon e iku. This is actually not used too commonly nowadays with young people because they're so similar, right? That you can actually use them both. 
That being said though, there are situations where you can't use both interchangeably, so just be careful. For example, you cannot follow the neat particle with the not particle for possession, but you can follow the air particle with the not particle for possession. So that's kind of tricky, for example. Like if you were on a bus, and for example, you had a bus to Osaka. Well, you could say Osaka et no bus, a bus to Osaka. But you cannot say Osaka ni no bus. No, 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 never. You can't say that. So just be careful. While they are most of the time interchangeable, it's not always interchangeable. And the ni particle is really focusing on the destination, whereas the e particle is more focused on the journey, the direction of that action. Okay, so now we have masenka. So you can actually use the negative form of a verb to act as an invitation to do that action. Very similar in English, where you would say, won't you come with us, for example, right? It's won't come, but here it's used in a question and it makes it more of an invitation. The same thing can be done in Japanese. Now, one quick thing before we get into the nuts and bolts is in your textbook, all they teach you at this stage is that masenka, remember the polite negative that they called the present form negative, the polite negative masenka here can be used as an invitation, but it's not just masenka that can be used here as an invitation, it's any nai form both the casual knife form or the polite knife form. And you can even have it with or without the question marker ka. So just so you know, what we're talking about right now with masenka applies with masen. As well as nai. And also naika. So let's have a look at this sentence. Isho ni nomimasen ka? So won't you have a drink together with me? So here we use masen ka or masen or nai or naika to act as a form of invitation to do that action. Won't you have a drink together? Masen here is the negative form of mas in the polite form, literally meaning won't drink. But when phrased in a question with kind of a rising innotation, it means won't you drink, here acting as an invitation. So as I said, it can be used with both the polite negative, masenka, as well as just simply masen, or it can be used with the casual nai form, the casual negative, nai or naika. All four of them can be used to act as an invitation. Now, in terms of the nuance, the difference between these four, I have a little chart here that you can have a look at. And masenka here at the top is kind of the stock standard textbook phrase. That's why it's taught to you here uh, in a very early lesson three. And this is an invitation in polite speech. If you wanted to speak a little bit less polite, you could just simply say masen instead of masenka. Isho ni pizza tabemasenka? Won't you have pizza together with me? I could say isho ni pizza tabemasen. This makes it a little bit more friendly or casual. And we can go down the line and actually make it more casual with simply just the nai form. For example, isho ni pizza tabe nai? So here I'm inviting in a more casual setting. And then finally we have naika. Now be careful with this one. This comes across as very strong, almost masculine, very kind of direct. I wouldn't necessarily recommend using this until you've really gotten familiar with Japanese. But you can, for example, and you may see being used in lots of media, here, naika being used as an invitation. Isho ni pizza tabe naika. <laughs> so it feels a little bit stronger, right? The reason why is when you put ka with an, just a casual form, it does feel a little bit strong. And so normally um, it's not used. Um, it, it is a little bit more of a strong thing. Maybe for example, if your personality is strong and direct, then you may use naika. But on the safe side, I would recommend not using it until you've learned more advanced Japanese. Next we have frequency adverbs, and here these are adverbs that you can put in a sentence to show the frequency in which you do an action, how often that action is done. And this is very very simple to use, for example, mainichi, every day. 
毎日英語の授業があるからうんざりだよよくオフン俺バンタムでよく飲んでるんでお暇な時にでもいらしてください時々 sometimes 時々遊びに来てもいいですかもちろんだ Well, all of these adverbs can be used to show the frequency that you do something. So that was how often you do something, and there's actually the opposite as well how often you don't do something. There are two adverbs that you're going to be learning in this lesson, and this is showing how infrequently you do an action. The first one here is amadi, also seen as unmadi, and this means not much. The other one is zen zen. And that means not at all, never, absolutely not. So these are used with the negative form of a verb to show either that you don't do that action very much, amari shinai, or that you never do it, zen zen shinai, absolutely never do it. So, for example, you could say, amari、mm, ski janai, I don't really like it very much. Or maybe there's something you absolutely would never eat. You could say, Zen Zen Tabemasen, or Zen Zen Tabenai. I absolutely won't eat it. That's it. Very, very simple. So keep an eye out for these frequency adverbs. They're very useful in showing how often you do or don't do a certain action. Finally, we have word order. Now, this is actually one really important skill for you guys to develop in your Japanese learning journey. If you can get more and more familiar with how Japanese sentences are actually broken down and structured in the little bits and pieces, it's going to make your life so easy to understand Japanese and break it down. So, in Japanese, every single sentence is kind of comprised of Different little sections. You could actually put like a little mini box around each of the different sections of a sentence. Becoming familiar with how a sentence is structured, as well as how you can kind of break it down, is going to be absolutely indispensable for you. Because actually, Japanese word order in a sentence is actually pretty flexible. It's not set in stone and you can move pieces all around. This is thanks to these particles that we've been learning. You can actually divide up a sentence very simply just with the particles. Articles, and you could actually move them around and they would still hold the same meaning. Like, for example, if we have a look at a sentence that we've already learnt today, for example, eat lunch at a park. Koen de hiru gohan o taberu. Well, you could divide this sentence by these particles. So we have koen de, we have hiru gohan o, and then finally we have taberu. These three sections you can move around almost freely at will. The only thing that you can't move around is that the verb needs to be at the end. For example, koen de hiru gohan o taberu. I could say hiru gohan o koen de taberu. So you see, it still maintains the same meaning even though you move the pieces around. Now, it may not necessarily be right on maybe one of your grammar tests or something, so be careful.、Uh, if you're at school, make sure to follow the way that they teach you in class. However, just know that these pieces you can actually move around, and you're going to see this a lot when you actually start looking at Japanese media and actually when you start looking at how Japanese is actually used rather than how it's taught in the textbooks. So, becoming familiar with how the sentences are broken down and how you can move the pieces with the Particles is going to be very beneficial to you and your Japanese study, and that's actually why I do、um, my let's plays and vocab videos to really help kind of immerse you in a kind of guided way through how Japanese sentences are broken down. So, if you haven't checked out those videos, I highly recommend checking out the let's play playlist. All of those videos, I break down every single sentence so you can learn everything no matter what level you are. So, a huge o t s k a r a s a m a everyone. That was a very big lesson. We learned some very important pieces of language that unfortunately、uh, Genki doesn't do a super great job of teaching. But it's not necessarily just Genki. Most learning resources for foreigners teach in this way. And the reason why is because there's this kind of required language in order to understand this. So, what they try and do is teach you made up rules that don't exist in Japanese to try and help overcome those challenges. However, realistically, you as a learner, you'd be much better off ignoring these made up rules and instead just learn the thing that you need to learn. 
For example, the nigh form of a verb. If you simply learn what the nigh form of a verb is whenever you learn a verb, all of your problems go away. <laughs> you don't have to worry about any of those silly exceptions and rules. It's really, really simple. If it ends in an ah, it is a complicated verb, right? An oo verb or a gordan. If it ends in an e or an e sound, then it's simple. It's just a ru verb. And that's it. If it's a ru verb, you don't have to do anything with it. And if it's an oo verb or a complicated one, a gordan, then remember you have the go sounds, the five sounds that you need to use when conjugating. So I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Hopefully this lesson helped you with some of these points. I know personally, um, I studied at university for several years, about three or four years, and I found a lot of these things really confusing throughout my entire time at university. It was never really taught in this simple manner that I'm now teaching you guys. So hopefully my experience can help you guys uh, get over some of these hurdles that often trip up a lot of learners uh, when they learn Japanese. So if you like this video, please consider like subscribing. And if you want to help support the channel as I'm trying to work full time and I'm working as hard as I can, getting as many videos out as I can, then please consider supporting the channel on Patreon and come say hi in the Game Gengo Discord. I'm always hanging out and we have a really great Discord where we help each other out with our Japanese. We even have Japanese only chat rooms. We talk about video games, have fun. So if you want to join a cool group of like minded Japanese students, then feel free to come join us on the Game Gengo Patreon. Thanks so much, guys, for watching. And I'll see you all again in the next video. Good luck with your Japanese studies. See ya.